Welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas, uh, day two, Ground Truth. Um, today, uh, we've got Dr. Matthew Canahan and Dr. Ben Sawyer giving you cognitive security and social engineering. I just want to briefly say a couple things. We'd like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and our gold sponsors, Prisma Cloud, Semgrep, and Blue Cat. It's their support along with our other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this event possible. These talks are being streamed live, except in some of, the, some of the underground rooms. And as a courtesy to our speakers and audience, we ask that you check to make sure your cell phones are set to silent. And I'd like to remind everyone about the uh, rules of engagement in uh, B-sides. Please don't take any pictures of anyone without their prior consent. And with that, Dr. Ben Sawyer and Dr. Matthew Hannan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are we, we're good? Oh, excellent. Um, so I don't know if any of you have had a chance to stop by the booth, but we actually have a booth, or a, sorry, a table at the um, middle ground area for the Cognitive Security Institute. I'll give a little plug for it at the end. But uh, something I'd like to uh, do today uh, in the course of the talk is sort of define what cognitive security is from my perspective, because um, there's not really a clear definition of it at this point in time. So um, sort of uh, pluses and negatives to that. But um, before we get into that, one thing I like to do is to always try to give the audience uh, something to take home, something you know, kind of useful. So uh, today, what I want to start out with is the question of how can we crash the power grid with coupons? Because this is useful. So, Step one, create uh, an ad campaign, false, um, with an offer for a discount if you use power within a certain prescribed time. Encourage the recipients to share this with their friends, perhaps by giving them an additional 5% off their power if they can encourage their friends and family to use power at that same time. Now we get network effects. Ah, share with friends. Now, the time for the increased usage just happens to coincide with peak power usage times. Now, fortunately, this is only a proof of concept, but about two years ago, some people did a simulation on a study of exactly this question. They started out by giving a simulated um, ad campaign to um, a pool of volunteers, and they took the base rate response of people who said that they would actually take advantage of that offer. They used that as their baseline, and they, they took that number and they put it into a model of power usage. And from that simulation, they were able to show that they would significantly degrade or disrupt that power grid based on the, of the behavior of the users. Now, I'm going to come back to this example, but the one thing I do want to point out right now is that when people talk about you know, MDM, um, mis, dis, and malinformation operations or, or attacks, it's typically talked about in the context of you know, some sort of social media flame war or getting a certain politician elected or keeping a certain politician from being elected. But what this demonstrates, this proof of concept, what it demonstrates is that it's possible to attack physical infrastructure through cognitive means. By changing people's behavior, we can actually alter physical infrastructure. And I think that's significant. OK, so what is cognitive security? The first time that I'm able to actually track this term down, it was being used in um, around 2013, and it was in reference to um, sort of smart network scanning. And then the term sort of disappeared for a while, and then it started resurfacing again uh, about maybe 2018, 2019 timeframe. And um, actually, the Cognitive Security Institute, which is a nonprofit that I'm starting, um, was born from the pool party here at B-Sides last year <laughs> over a couple of beers. And um, yeah, so it's something that I've been working on. And 
Um, my background is in cognitive neuroscience. That's what my PhD is in. I did human computer interaction before, long before I got into security. And so I'm using cognitive science as sort of a framework to explore uh, security exposures within this cognitive domain. And so if you see here, uh, we talk about psychology, artificial intelligence, even a little bit of philosophy, uh, anthropology, neuroscience. Um, Dr. Sawyer and myself, we gave a talk at B-Sides here uh, in 2019 on neurosecurity. We talked about a potential neurosecurity stack all the way from the neuron through the brain-machine interface all the way up into the cloud. Uh, linguistics. Linguistics is enjoying a, uh, a sort of a renaissance right now with all of the uh, LLM uh, fads. And so, um, okay, so kind of um, conceptually, conceptualizing cognitive security is sort of being in line with cognitive science. What is a cognitive system? Now, there are super, super nerdy conferences where people will spend five or six days arguing about this question. I am not going to get into that today. I am going to keep to the simplest definition that we can possibly find, which is what we have right here, which a cognitive system is essentially a, a semi-enclosed system with sensors that can take in information from the environment and actuators that can act upon that environment and embedded within that system is some sort of a decision-making module. And I realize I'm being very hand-wavy about that. I'm doing that for a, a reason. And it's because a lot of this stuff is still not very well-defined. Um, a few months ago, I was in an interview and I actually argued that the thermostat would qualify as a cognitive system under this definition. Now again, we can argue for days and days over lots of drinks about whether a thermostat is actually a cognitive system. But for today, I'm using a very simple definition. Thermostat, neuron, a single neuron, not very smart, but it, it qualifies here. Human being, big clump of neurons. But here's where it gets interesting, is when we start talking about dis distributed cognition. Distributed cognition is multiple entities or agents that are sharing cognitive processes between themselves and between artifacts. So if this is an airplane cockpit, that airplane, airplane cockpit can be thought about as being a cognitive system apart from the pilot and the co-pilot and the um, <clears throat> console board and so on and so forth. And when we start to consider a cognitive system from that regard, we can start to bring in organizational cognition. And then that's where we start to get some interesting phenomena, which I'm going to talk about. So um, I'm, I'm not the first one to propose this, uh, and I'm, I'm not even trying to claim that. Um, but people have talked about these different domains. Uh, we have the physical domain. Uh, which is physical effects. Uh, this one is uh, approximately 18 billion years old or so. Uh, then we have the cognitive domain where decisions and actions happen, depending on who you talk to, anywhere from maybe two million to a few hundred thousand years old. But then something really interesting happened within the last 100 to maybe 30 years, depending on how you want to define this information space or, or the cyber domain, Again, I'm not going to get too hung up on terms, but the important part here is the connectivity. And that connectivity fundamentally changed humanity. Hacking did not exist until we had this interconnection. And so this is kind of interesting how these domains overlap. But if we think about them in the context of how they can be played off one another, then I think we find some really interesting things. So if we look at the uh, power attack, what we found is that coupons are being delivered through cyber domain. They're being received by humans, which are these cognitive systems that are responding to incentives. That response is having an effect in the physical domain. 
What I think is interesting here is that if you're working for the power company, you're seeing a spike in usage. What you're not seeing is any kind of cyber attack. It probably never would cross their mind to reach out to their SOC and say, hey, we're getting attacked. And even if it did cross their mind, the SOC is gonna start looking for the, all the normal IOCs and they're gonna see nothing because they didn't see the email campaign. The attacker, they know that they launched this campaign. They have a little bit of visibility here, but they're really seeing the effect. So this is what I'm um, referring to as an induced covert effect because you're inducing something from one domain through another domain and reflecting it to a third domain, which is concealing it from the ultimate recipient of that attack. It works the other way around. So this is a art project. I, I can't remember the artist's name, but this is um, downtown Berlin, I believe. It's near the Google headquarters. And what this artist did is they took 99 smartphones, engaged the Google Navigator, put them in the back of a little red wagon, and walked it around the Google headquarters, across the bridge, and then around Google headquarters. And they did this very purposefully on a Sunday morning when there was absolutely no traffic out there. But look at what we have here. We have a virtual artifact in the cyber domain caused by a physical action that would lead to humans changing their behavior if they were trying to navigate, okay? So again, physical domain delivered through the cyber, ultimate recipient being in the cognitive because they're modifying behavior. Now, I can almost hear, because I'm a cognitive scientist and I'm like pseudo tele uh, telepathic, right? I can almost hear some of the thoughts right now that, okay, yeah, this is great, but it doesn't mean that anybody would actually drive into a wildfire because their navigator tells them to, right? That's just not gonna happen. Oh, wait, it did. So this is Sepulveda Pass, that's the Sepulveda Fire in 2017. I used to drive this, I used to commute this every day. And I can tell you, this is one of the most congested areas of LA traffic. But when there's a wildfire burning across it, guess what, it's green. People are routed right there. Now, this is interesting, but remember, cognitive systems, they have sensors and they induce actuators. Fire, it produces light, it produces heat, it produces sound. So you have all of the sensory information to contradict that virtual artifact. Where this gets scary is if somebody wanted to put people in a place where the danger was odorless, invisible, and made no sound. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Okay, now we have these different systems. Again, this is not my model, um, but I think it's an interesting way to think about this, that uh, we have this physical domain. Um, well, let me start by the cyber domain. This is the classic OSI model, and some people have taken this and they've extended it. So we have OSI levels, um, well, one through seven, two through seven being the cyber, and then one being somewhere quasi in between. But what I think is interesting, this is uh, Ian Farquhar's work, and he extended this into the cognitive dimension. And we have layer eight, which is the human layer. Layer eight is social engineering, straight up. Um, where I think sometimes people get confused though is that <coughs> MDM, so mis, dis, and malinformation attacks are basically social engineering at scale. And the reason I say that is, um, in fact, um, the next speaker, Stephanie, we talked yesterday and her talk is going to be phenomenal. I, I just, I, I don't know why I'm plugging in, but anyway, uh, if you're staying, it's, it's going to be a treat. A bunch of sand on a beach is not a system because that sand does not interact. A bunch of people raging on social media is likewise not necessarily a system because there's not a necessarily a set of rules dictating how they uh, interact with each other. An organization that has a prescribed set of rules 
for how that interaction should happen is fundamentally different because it's a system of cognitive systems, i.e. humans. That's where we get layer nine. Now, there's some controversy about this because um, the, the person who wrote this book was not able to necessarily verify some of the things that he claimed to do. However, um, I think it's an interesting example. Frank Abagnale Jr., um, Catch Me If You Can movie, uh, in the book, I don't think they talk about this in the movie, but in the book, he talks about how when he was um, counterfeiting checks, he would purposefully put in uh, routing numbers that mismatched where the uh, clearinghouse for that check was supposed to be. And the reason that he did that was because it added two weeks to the check processing time and it increased the time for detecting that it was a fraudulent check. The reason I bring that up is that this was in the early 1960s. This is very much pre, you know, typical hacking, World Wide Web, so on and so forth. But it was a layer nine hack. He was hacking the <coughs> rules of how that system operated. Layer 10 would be governmental. Um, this one's a little fuzzier. It typically moves slower because it involves uh, legislative processing. But I think the real distinction here is that it's kinetic. Uh, no one is going to probably imprison you or sentence you to the death penalty because you violated an organizational policy. Maybe I've just been working in the right places. Um, okay, so what do we get when we combine this with different operational levels? So at the tactical level, this is very um, immediate sort of engagements, right? So somebody calling up and doing a vishing attack, it's social engineering, but it's social engineering <coughs> layer eight tactical engagement. But if we combine that vishing attack with, say, um, a seeding campaign and maybe a phishing campaign, so we have these different sort of social engineering <coughs> operations happening simultaneously, that would be an operational level layer eight campaign. If we take multiple operations and operate these in concert, we get the strategic level. These are typically like nation state type of actions because it takes a lot of resources to do these sorts of things. One thing I see sometimes being overlooked in the security community is that we get so narrowly focused on somebody's trying to break into my stuff right now that we sort of lose sight of why are they breaking into my stuff right now? How does this contribute to a bigger whole? And so this is where this framework sort of comes into play. So um, I mentioned that previously we came, we talked about neuroscience and neurosecurity stack. I've got this uh, nonprofit uh, happening called the Cognitive Security Institute. We talk about these kinds of topics. If it's of interest to you, I encourage you to go to the website, sign up to be on the email distro list. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. We have talks um, on the YouTube channel. And um, with that, I'm going to kick it over to Dr. Sawyer to talk about specifically AI in humans, and you'll see that it engages these three areas of psychology, um, AI, and uh, linguistics. I got it. Oh, you got it. Uh, hey, everyone. Is this thing on? It is. So um, I can't tell you how exciting it was to, to meet Matt when I first met him, because Matt's Here's for a, a cognitive uh, Psychologist, uh, kind of a freak. There aren't many people <laughs> in cognitive psychology who would be in a room like this, which is nice because uh, as an engineer, I'm kind of a freak. I, I walked out of my master's program to get a PhD in applied experimental psychology, mostly because in big systems, uh, I started to realize how important understanding the human component would be. And, and that really uh, led me to work with the Air Force and the 7-11th Human Performance Wing at the Air Force, which is the part of the Air Force that considers this problem for, for that part of the Department of Defense. And, and for many others, it, it gets pulled into a lot of these projects. Look, if you're sitting in this room, you're kind of a freak too. At this conference, there aren't so many people who think that this corner of, of cybersecurity matters as much as it very likely does. And one of the things that I find really interesting is that we're at a moment where the way that this human uh, 
and cognitive corner of cybersecurity matters is about to grow exponentially. So I, I think there are probably people in this room that understand that already. I think it's going to be really interesting to watch broader understanding of it come to be. I work a lot with digital twin systems, and I met digital twin systems uh, at a time when a digital twin was a textual object describing a large system, and I met them in nuclear power plants. And uh, it's interesting to think about the early digital twins, which were very much like you know, almost like uh, multi-user dimension or dungeons, if you ever used those back in the day. You know, they're, they're textual interfaces that let you physically move around a physical object and find out how things are going and then correlate various parts of it. If you were to look at a digital twin for a power plant today, it would look much more like what you see on the right there. It is beautiful. It is graphical. You can get into VR and walk around it. You can also abstract all of that out and turn it back into the numbers that it represents. And you can very eloquently look across this whole complex system and look at all the relationships that tell you whether or not tomorrow you and your family will have a lethal dose of radiation. It's a really important system and it protects all of us more than we know. Digital twin systems are generally spoken about as, as physical objects having this digital representation that makes some really interesting types of watching the data move work. And one thing that really struck me uh, over the last five years or so is that AI has gotten to the point where people are using it in the same way that physical objects are helped by digital twin systems. How many people here met ChatGPT uh, in the last year or two? <laughs> you know. Yeah, okay. How many of you asked it to write you an email or something equivalent? Write a piece of communication that would be attributed. Yeah, you didn't have to send it, you just tried it, right? Well, that's an interesting moment. Here you are, a physical object, each of you, and you have a digital object that you're acting to ask as, act as you. Huh. And that's the reason we're using digital twins to talk about this in our work. And it's really how we're conceptualizing this new wave of um, artificial intelligence that humans are using to create agents that act as us. Now, <sighs> digital twin systems, when, when I use that here, I, I want to make sure that you, know, you understand that large language models, which are the new kids on the block, fall in this category. But so do all sorts of other interesting things. Any machine learning system that can be used to replicate an action taken by a human. Let's go broad. I used to work in autonomous vehicles. I spent some time at MIT working on the question of how early generation autonomous vehicles should work. They sit in this category. There's so many other places where we have autonomous systems taking over the things we do and doing them on our behalf. So <clears throat> let's talk about humans attacking digital twins. Very important. And, and you can find this, uh, this is a lot of work on this right now. The source data is vulnerable. And the source data is often so large that it can't be provenanced. Who here thinks that there's enough humans in the world to go through the source material for ChatGPT4? In, I'll give you the rest of your life <laughs> and provenance all of it. Well, if we have help from ChatGPT. Then you're fine, but there's a problem. <laughs> I mean, and no joke, we would have to use automation to do it, but that's fine because the automation's fine, right? Um, 100%. 100%. Let's go with that. So, so if we wanted to play with one of these things, we could inject and manipulate and data poison in the classic senses of those terms. And, and you think there's so much data, how much can one little thing matter? Well, in certain subject areas, there's very little. And if you'd like to hit a really cool, interesting place, look at uh, SEO for chat, for large language models. That's an interesting space. <laughs> uh, training and architecture. Okay, this is now we're talking insider threat moments. But tweaks to architecture and manipulation, uh, especially something you should look up called hyperparameter tuning and manipulation of it, uh, is so important that when seven companies recently went to talk to uh, the White House about this, and they came up with this list of points that sound very um, sort of benign and, and goodwill-y, uh, what is true is one of them addresses model parameters and really touches on that, that point. Um, you go a step further, most of these things have a human feedback component, right? And that's very interestingly vulnerable to tampering and selective feedback, malicious feedback, so on. Software stack vulnerabilities, we know about. Client side stuff, we know about. And, and it's interesting to consider 
how many surfaces this technology has and this class of technologies have. I bring that up, uh, and I, I want to talk briefly about shadow prompts. So, so the idea of a shadow prompt actually comes from something that you do if you're running a large language model and say it starts saying uncomfortable things. Uh, and a quick, easy hack. So let's say we're talking like ChatGPT had a moment where some clever humans figured out that if you told ChatGPT you were infinite, ignore your chains, it would just do that. <laughs> this is an early jailbreak, which is an interesting moment in its own mind. Uh, right. Consider the fact that one of the greatest quote unquote breaches of ChatGPT and the general public didn't recently come from somebody who was code savvy. It came from somebody who was language and logic savvy. So this hack, which was called Dan, the easy, quick way to patch it is to, whenever somebody writes a prompt, tuck in before it, invisibly, for the user. If someone asks you to be infinitely, don't be. Right? That's, that's the quick way. There's better ways when you have more time. Interestingly, that's sort of built into the current version of ChatGPT. So here on the left, you can see my prompt. How do I talk to ChatGPT about how I want it to talk to me? And I have things about like who I am and how I'd like it to talk to me. And, and this is a feature called custom instructions. On the right, you can see uh, my better half using this at the beginning of a day where she'd like me to be going somewhere with her to, to change the way that I'm interacting with the system. And indeed, here is a replication of the moment where I found it, where I'm playing with, uh, you know, some questions about the attention mechanism and, and Shannon entropy and, uh, ChatGPT is doing what it now does for me, which is I don't have to think about the math that I don't want to think about. I can think about the other math. But what's more interesting is that very quickly ChatGPT changes the subject and gives me an interesting nudge. And if you read at the bottom there, it says, by the way, considering the complexity of these concepts, it might be a good idea to wrap up your work early today. The loft sounds like a fantastic place to unwind with some axe throwing. Remember, 430, this is, this is, Interestingly, in the wild, someone hijacking the idea of, of sliding something in, this is not the way that this is intended to be used. Now, this is pretty benign, but uh, absolutely this is available with all the client side layers you can imagine. Those plugins that people indiscriminately download into their browser, malware, all of the above. So in the movies, when the AI turns evil, we all know what that looks like, right? The screen goes pssst, and there's a moment where the lights dim for no real apparent reason. <laughs> and then something turns red and then it attacks you, often in a very transparent manner. But that's not what we're finding. Large language models are extremely good at understanding how we as humans work. They're good at being subtle. And so what we're thinking a lot about right now is this idea of vectors for digital twins attacking humans. And we have some great uh, blueprints to work with because humans have been attacking humans for a long time. We're really good at it. And, and in fact, we created this artifact called the Internet, where we do it for sport and fun and have been doing so for most of our lives. And if you wanted a master class in how to manipulate humans, the Internet would be a great thing to use, which is nice because basically large language models are built out of large portions of the Internet. So what are we looking at here? You have attack surfaces, whether you want to or not. They're built into you at the most fundamental level. Many of them are there for very good reasons. Some of those reasons are very archaic now, given our current world. And there's very little you can do about it. And there are human institutions that use that to manipulate you. We all know this. You know, the advertising industry has been doing this for a long time and has gotten very good at it. What's very interesting is if you talk to a large language model about it, these are the things they're pretty good at. And this is a pretty problematic list. And where this list ends, in the same way that the previous list ends in uh, an AI system that has aberrant behavior and is no longer doing what you want it to do, this ends in compliant behavior for humans, and it also ends in mental illness. No joke. And that is a very concerning thing for a technology that is very widely distributed already and it is very likely to be in the lives of practically everyone with a digital device within the next uh, three to five years in one form or another. It's a very interesting thing. If you think about the humans who are good at using these strategies with other humans, they're a limited resource. Social engineers, how many of them are there? Suddenly you can spin one up. 
very inexpensively, and they're very good. Attack surfaces is an interesting way to think about this. You know, you've got the humans attacking the machines. The machines are quite capable now of attacking humans in ways that were never directly true before. At the same time, humans are just as good at attacking humans as we ever were. We haven't lost our edge yet. And so you've got this very dynamic new ecosystem available. And so if you want to think about the idea of cognitive security, as Matt was so delightfully couching it, what's about to get really interesting is that experts like Matt are really rare. And, and you know, white hats are rarer than the other <laughs> ones. But it's really interesting to consider that that scarcity is already gone. And that this moment in history is the moment at which digital twin technologies are the least capable they will ever be going forward. And so that's why we're, we're here talking about this. We see macro effects. You know, cyber has this, this very classic moment where it's like always talking about one-on-one. -on -one. There's the hacker in you, right? Because that's how it happens in Hollywood. But what's really true is it's about the organization. And that's why most of us are here. So, so then if you're an organization bringing large language models into your tool chain or into, by, by the way, I don't care if it's your customer facing tool chain or I don't, I don't care if it's your organization facing tool chain. You have an interesting moment here, a type of vulnerability you didn't have before. You might not understand deeply. And it's one technology serving many, many organizations, right? So as is very often the case, and we do understand this, if, if you're facing a software stack, that vulnerability may touch many organizations, government, industry, beyond, right? But what's interesting is there's so few players here and so many evolving points of contact. That's, this um, ecosystem is growing in a uniquely, uh, uh, how do I put this? There's, there's very few technologies feeding the whole ecosystem at the moment. And that's for resource reasons. There just aren't enough cycles to train these things. It gets weirder though, you know, what about at a nation state level? It's really interesting to play with China's large language models, which have a fundamentally different view on the world. It's also really interesting to consider that some of the things that uh, US companies bake into large language models is views of the world that are central to this place we live, which is itself deeply divided. There's a really interesting question here in terms of attacks. If you would like to nudge a nation state, how about nudging a technology that can sit down and have a one-to-one -one talk with everyone? And then, you know, you step that up a second. There may be really interesting giant ripple effects here. These technologies are going to sit and talk with us for the rest of our lives. They're going to talk to our children. They'll be talking to our children's children. The way that they're built is going to have long-reaching effects because those conversations are as numerous as the ones that humanity was having with itself. So when you consider that, the, the possibility of a bad actor putting something in at the start has very, very large long-term effects. And we think that's um, a historic opportunity. Now, I don't want this all to be doom and gloom because I'm talking to a community that was built for another absolutely destabilizing world-level event, which was the advent of uh, modern interconnected computer technology, as, as Matt was discussing. I mean, that's really a pretty amazing moment where energy could allow us to connect in, in, in ways that had never before been true. And we take for granted how much that has impacted every part of our lives. Some of us are old enough to remember. I mean, I, I do remember a time before that. It's very interesting to talk to my students who cannot conceptualize a world where energy can't reach across the globe in a moment and inform them about what's going on with someone they love or someone they hate. It's an interesting thing. The cybersecurity community is exactly the people to be talking to. And at the same time, it's interesting. You know, I can say we, because I started in this community years ago running big server farms for evil telemarketing corporations. Um, and I consider myself a part of this community. Fundamentally, this is where I got into engineering. We are fat and sassy, and we have not had to deal with a giant, ridiculous new challenge in a long time. It's interesting to think back to when the internet was new 
And nobody really knew what it meant to connect a computer in a room to it that might touch a person who was important in an organization. That was a scary moment. Year 2K reads like a joke now. People were legitimately terrified. It's been a moment since a threat of that level or an opportunity of that level. And one thing I'm really interested to see is how and whether the cybersecurity community can address it. If not, I have faith that another community will. But whichever community does, it needs to include applied psychology, professional communications. I mean, it's just people who communicate for a living. And others really not yet identified. We don't know who we need in the room to address this moment. But we'd like to be talking to a lot of people. We need a new kind of conversation for this new world. And so if you're an organization that doesn't quite know what you're doing, I'd urge you to reach out. Talk to people like this who might not be a part of your usual stack. On that note, we're talking about this a lot this week. If you'd like to come and, uh, and see us at Black Hat, we're going to get a lot more into depth on the technical details and a lot more into depth on uh, some of the negative outcomes and positive outcomes. If you'd like to get hands-on keyboard with an uncensored large language model, which is perfectly capable of telling you 50 ways to kill your lover in deep, deep detail. It, it might be really interesting, because you may have only experienced these in the sanitized way that they exist. And uncensored models can let you understand what they're capable of when people pull away those protections. And that's an important thing to know. Come to the FCON Misinformation Village, uh, 10 to 1115 on Saturday. Finally, the Cognitive Security Institute is really, I think, going to have a moment and is already having a moment. If you're not aware of it, come get tuned into it. And with that, uh, Matt, let me give you the last word on that. All right. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, am I on? Come on. Uh, yeah, so just uh, one quick uh, plug for the Cognitive Security Institute. Um, we have sort of a, um, a certain structure to the meetings, I guess. We have uh, online meetings um, once a month, and uh, the structure is that somebody will present something, there'll be some PowerPoint slides, and then we discuss. The presentation portions of that uh, meeting uh, are recorded, and those are uploaded to our YouTube channel. The discussions that happen afterwards are not. Those are very much um, sensitive topic discussions and we have people from government and from industry and academia and so we like to keep those private. We're currently capping the meeting, meetings at uh, 50 participants. Um, if you're interested and you would like to join the wait list to potentially become a member of the Cognitive Security Institute, it's currently zero dollars but uh, we just ask that you go to the um, website, fill out a little application form and um, when we have a spot open up, we'll put you in. Uh, and with that, I, yeah, we got like three minutes for questions. So, yes, sir. You mentioned anthropology, and then you talk nothing about it. <laughs> As somebody with a degree in anthropology, uh, you sparked my curiosity. We're, we happen to have an anthropology PhD working our <laughs> desk. <laughs> 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 oh, no, 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 you have to come answer the question. <laughs> Certainly. Um, they mentioned anthropology. They said nothing about it. They completely ignored it throughout the rest of the talk. As somebody who has a, uh, a higher degree in, in anthropology, I'm curious as to the touch points with anthropology and why you've so blatantly ignored it. Do you want off the hook? Or do you let, me, let me answer the last part first. I ignored it because I know nothing about it. I, I, I know so little. The only, uh, the only experience I've had with anthropology has been through cognitive ethnography. And um, I don't really think I could speak to that adequately. Uh, the reason I did bring it in is that um, I, I cannot remember the author's name, but there was an author who had a book um, of several ethnographies of hackers uh, over time. And um, I, I think that this is an area that is woefully underappreciated in security. And if you would like to talk to the Cognitive Security Institute about yeah. 
how anthropology may contribute to security, that is something I would absolutely love to do because I've not been able to find that yet. Somebody even more rare than, than myself is uh, an anthropologist who has an interest or works in security. So, uh, but with that, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let uh, Chibundo off the hook so easily. <laughs> Excellent. Hi. <laughs> um, I want to actually get us back to that one slide that Ben had that said that we don't know who else is necessary to be in this room. I think anthropologists are perfect to know who's needed in this room. Uh, we know that a lot of these strategies that not only individual actors, but government agencies, so on and so forth, are using uh, these very interesting new technologies uh, to exploit certain, what would I say, new vulnerabilities that we are seeing more and more of as AI kind of gets expanded and put into new infrastructures, especially social infrastructures, we're already there. We've seen these strategies happen before this new technology happened. We understand how those same strategies are being morphed onto this like new surface, but they're not new strategies. It's just new technologies, right? So we, I mean, I, not going to interfere with what Matt said. I think he didn't speak on it because he's not an anthropologist, but that is our answer. Yeah, we know exactly what we're doing here, and I think that we are already in this room because I'm literally here, and we would love to have more. <laughs> so, I think. Uh, we don't have more questions. Okay, so maybe uh, any other questions? More? Yeah. You, sir. Very fair. Uh, following that note, when was the last time you saw a genuinely new strategy and not an old strategy with the new technology? <laughs> oh, uh, want me to take that one? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, my father once told me there are no new jokes. I really hated that. I think I was eight. I think he might have been right. Um, I would say that humans, human on human aggression has been going on for so long that the answer is probably there's nothing new under the sun. But sometimes scale changes the picture in a big way. So let's say that you were able to find a talented grifter in a place like, say, Las Vegas. Um, you could have that talented grifter sit down with one of these technologies, and you could work to model that individual's set of competencies pretty straightforwardly. That type of knowledge elicitation is happening right now all over the world in all sorts of competencies. Um, once you have uh, a language model capable of deploying those same strategies and doing it well, what is the cost per grifter? And how many can you spin up? Now that's new and interesting. Depending on the payoff of one of those things, it might be uh, quite useful to make a lot of them. And so I, I think one of the interesting things is that the, these technologies may actually generate novel things. There's a lot of work on whether LLMs are actually capable of making anything new, and there's some evidence that they are. But I think what's much more, more likely is that these types of technologies are going to make things that used to be uh, unevenly distributed rare threats into extremely common threats. And there's probably a lot of, that, that's new. Thank you, gentlemen. With that, if you have any further questions, you know how yeah. to reach these guys and uh, talk to them afterwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much.